Good morning. Again, thank you for coming on time. I really appreciate it. I saw that Scylla came in, so I knew we could start right away. Um, I do want to comment, uh, those of you who complain about uh, how difficult it is to get into our building and how difficult it is to get into our computer systems, uh, to look at today's uh, New York Times, uh, talking about 20,000 patients being seen in the ED uh, at the Stanford University Hospital, whose uh, data including personally identifiable health information was posted on the web for about uh, three weeks uh, and a very interesting set of failures. Uh, so just to let you know that we really do value security and why we're doing it is to in fact protect our patients. Uh, this is really a, a fun and, and special uh, of our grand rounds. Uh, it is one of our endowed grand rounds. I'm gonna have Bill, Ben Wilfon from our uh, a division of bioethics to uh, introduce um, one of my heroes. So, Ben. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure. Um, since this is New Year and there is uh, new interns, um, I, I usually take this opportunity to, uh, before introducing the speaker, to also uh, talk briefly about Truman Katz, who this grand rounds is uh, is uh, named after. And so I've got a couple quick slides to tell you all about uh, Truman, for those of you who didn't know him. He was the CEO of the hospital from 1979 to 2005 um, and led the institution during a very uh, critical time in its development um, and really shored up the institution and created the relationships that have really um, provided the foundation for where Seattle Children's is today. Um, he had, has many accomplishments, um, and you know we take for granted a lot of the things that are central to our activities, uh, the relationship that we have with the university uh, didn't exist um, prior to his arrival here. Um, the creation of the Seattle Car Cancer Care Alliance, a unique program between uh, Seattle Children's UW and Fred Hutch, and in general really promoting uh, the, a wide range of, of issues uh, related to the health of children. Um, but Truman also has had a very interesting uh, uh, interest in ethics, um, longstanding interest in issues like the quality of care uh, and respecting the role of families. And particular, he was interested in emerging issues, uh, complementary and alternative medicine, and also uh, the, the role of clinical research uh, in promoting the health of children. And as part of those interests, um, as he was getting ready uh, for his retirement, uh, his commitment to these issues and commitment to ethics uh, led him to push for the, the creation of what's now known as the Truman Katz Center for pediatric bioethics. We've now been here for uh, uh, six years. We now have seven core faculty and five affiliate uh, faculty who are involved in a range of uh, uh, scholarship, consultation, and education. And each year, uh, we have a grand rounds to um, honor uh, Truman's legacy. Unfortunately, he couldn't be with us this year. Um, I'm hoping he is watching on uh, our, our webcast. Um, but every year, uh, we invite uh, a nationally recognized scholar in bioethics, and this year when our faculty was talking about who we should invite, uh, we thought very quickly of our speaker today, Al Johnson, as somebody whom um, we re were really interested in having the opportunity to share his thoughts uh, with our community. Um, Al was here in Seattle for 11 years. He was the chair of what was then called the Department of Bioethics, now it's called the Department of Bioethics and Humanities. When he was here, it was called the Department of, of Medical History and Ethics. Um, he was here from 1980, roughly 1989 to 1999, somewhere in that range. Um, I'm not reading from my notes, so it, I have to check on my memory. Um, but before that, um, he was at University of California, San Francisco. He, was, he came there in 1972 and was uh, really was a pioneer in the field of clinical ethics, and in fact, he really, along with a number of other colleagues, really uh, had a huge impact on the way clinical eth ethics uh, as a profession and as, and as an activity has developed. In addition to having influence on uh, individual patients and clinicians in making their decisions, his experience also really was in the policy realm. He was a uh, commissioner for the, in the 1970s, the National Commission that developed the the foundation for the research regulations, the President's Commission in the 70s and 80s that really uh, developed a number of uh, ground 
groundbreaking materials that really have set the foundation for how we think about bioethics uh, today. Um, he received his PhD in 1967 from Yale in religious studies. He, he also um, was an ordained Catholic priest up in, until the until the mid 70s, and so he has a huge background. And it's my pleasure to introduce Al and to um, invite you to uh, share with us your thoughts. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Ben, very much. And uh, thank you, Tom, for your gracious introduction. Am I on? Am I on? Uh, yep, there I am. Okay. And uh, hello, Truman, if you're out there down in where Palm Desert, if you have the webcast at your swimming pool side. I'm really quite honored to deliver the Truman Katz lecture. During my tenure as a professor of medical ethics at University of Washington, I was delighted and impressed by Truman's interest in pediatric ethics that grew into the Truman Katz Center for Pediatric Bioethics. That center itself, uh, under the guidance of Ben Wolmond and my own fine student, Doug Dikema, um, makes a steady contribution to pediatric ethics. I'm also embarrassed to be the Truman Katz lecturer. Since I've been retired more than 10 years and have drifted further and further away from the current questions and issues in pediatric ethics. My own career in bioethics began in the neonatal intensive care nursery almost 40 years ago, and my first publication was The Ethics of Newborn Intensive Care in 1976, the days before Surfactin and ECMO and all of that. But it was a time when I could speak with confidence about cases and questions of pediatric ethics. My embarrassment is uh, somewhat tempered, however, by the belief that many years of contact with these questions has brought me some sort of wisdom, a wisdom that my early familiarity with the facts may have lacked. This makes me bold enough to address what is without doubt the central question of pediatric ethics, namely the moral relationship between a newborn and its parents. Being so central a question, it has been addressed many times by ethicists, indeed addressed in almost every word they write about any problem. I acknowledge that broad discussion. I will not review it, but only note a few of the early major contributions. These form the frame of the discussion that has continued through the subsequent, subsequent years and will be, to some extent, the object of my critique this morning. Pediatric ethics burst to attention in 1971. During the previous two decades, intensive care nurseries had gradually come into existence as new methods and new technologies allowed physicians to save smaller and smaller premature babies. The intensive care unit was, for its first 20 years, a very private place. A few cases made the news such as baby Patrick Kennedy, son of John and Jacqueline Kennedy, who was born three months premature and survived briefly in a Boston hospital. But in general, neonatologists and nurses agonized with parents over threatened babies, rejoiced over the clinical triumphs, and mourned the failures. Many nurseries established follow-up clinics where the living healthy triumphs could be shown off as beautiful babies and the absentees from those happy gatherings were remembered as the failures that death claimed or disability kept at home or institution bound. Still, the clinical world of neonatology was closed 
and private. That privacy was about to be disturbed. On Saturday, October the 6th, 1971, a large audience gathered at the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts to attend the Joseph P. Kennedy Foundation International Symposium on Human Rights, Retardation, and Research. The symposium was entitled, Choices on Our Conscience. The symposium opened with a shocking 30-minute film. This short movie was designed to be a lightning rod for debate about the topic of the symposium, the rights of retarded persons, a subject close to the heart of the Kennedy family, which cherished their retarded sister, Rosemary. I use the terminology of the time when I say retarded. The film reviewed in stark In stark episodes, the story of two young parents who refused to permit a simple operation that would save the life of their newborn baby. The baby was, in the language of the day, a Mongol, stricken with the genetic disorder trisomy 21 Down syndrome, which promises a future of mild to severe mental retardation or disability. The baby had a frequently associated defect, a blockage between the esophagus and the stomach that prevented the passage of food. Surgeons can easily correct that defect, but the child's developmental future is uncorrectable. The film parents refused to permit the surgery and the baby was allowed to die. <clears throat> the film was a composite of three cases that had occurred in the pediatrics department of Johns Hopkins University. Three of the founding figures of bioethics were the physicians involved in the cases. Dr. Robert Cook, who was chairman of the Department of Pediatrics, Dr. Norman Faust, the chief resident and also the teacher of of Ben and Doug as well, was the chief resident, and Bill Bartolome, who was the intern. Dr. Bartolome played himself in the film. During the early months of his internship, he found himself caring for a baby whose parents had refused life-saving surgery. He, and I quote, experienced a sense of moral outrage it was simply wrong, intolerable, unjust. Bill Bartolome felt that children with Down syndrome were full members of the human community with the same claim on medical care as any other person. No one in the actual film expresses a moral opinion about the events, but Dr. Bartolome's moral outrage is evident in his face and body language during the film. The film concluded with a discussion in which Dr. Cook, psychologist Sidney Callahan, health law professor William Curran of Harvard, sociologist Rene Fox of the University of Pennsylvania, and ethicist John Fletcher participated. As the final scene fades, the baby being carried by a grieving nurse into a back corner of the nursery to die, John Fletcher's hushed voice is heard. Wow. After the movie, Roger Mudd of CBS News moderated a panel. Remember, this was a program sponsored by the Kennedy Foundation, and they pulled the big hitters in. Professor Paul Freund of Harvard Law School and James Gustafson of Yale Divinity School, social critic Michael Harrington, social psychologist Sidney Callahan, and Senator Walter Mondale discussed the legal, ethical, social, psychological, and public policy aspects of the case. 
The Johns Hopkins baby became a landmark in the history of bioethics. Bill Bartholomew said of the film, it was for bioethics like a crystal in a supersaturated solution. It attracted attention, gave bioethics something concrete to teach and talk about. It also stimulated some of the earliest serious bioethical analysis. James Gustafson's commentary about that film, published in Perspectives in Biology and Medicine, is a careful dissection of the ethical problem. He showed with great skill and sympathy how the evolution of, how the evaluation of quality of life of a mongoloid child was at the center of the decision and presented a critique of that evaluation as a prejudiced view of human life. Soon afterwards, two pediatricians, Dr. Raymond Duff and A.G.M. Campbell, moved the problem from the prismatic case of a single child into the world of the intensive care nursery. Doctors Duff and Campbell reported in the New England Journal that 43 of 299 consecutive cases in the nursery at Yale New Haven Hospital, that is about 14%, resulted from the deliberate decisions to withdraw or withhold a life-saving treatment. Their paper stimulated a furor, and many letters of protest were written to the New England Journal, and also even to the president of Yale University, insisting that he dismiss Drs. Duff and Campbell. Father Richard McCormick reflected on the Duff and Campbell article in his JAMA article, To Save or Let Die. He revisited the familiar Catholic distinction between ordinary and extraordinary care in a creative way. The terms extraordinary, he said, was large enough to justify the omission of life-sustaining treatment on the basis of expected diminished quality of life, defined in terms of the potential for human relationships. John Fletcher's article, Abortion, Euthanasia, and the Care of the Defective Newborn, and H. Truman Engel Engelhart's Ethical Issues in Aiding the Death of Young Children, soon appeared, the former defending passive but not active euthanasia for seriously compromised newborns the latter contending that the maintenance of life for such children should be seen as the injury of continued life. Law professor John Robertson and pediatrician Norman Faust made a careful analysis of the legal issues raised by pediatric euthanasia. Their sobering article, Passive Euthanasia of Defective Infants, reminded providers and parents about the potential criminal liability of withholding care. They admitted that, quote, parents and health professionals with experience in the complex and heart-wrenching decisions might justifiably react to this legal analysis with shock and rage. They understood why Duff and Campbell had called for the law to be changed and suggested that a set of authoritative criteria be drawn up to designate precisely those classes of infants who could be allowed to die. These were the first flurry of bioethical articles to appear in the medical journal literature. Throughout these articles, the unquestioned premise was that the decision to treat or not treat, to save or let die, was the responsibility of the parents. The ethicists' articles did not question this premise, but rather attempted to provide rational criteria whereby the parents could make a morally grounded decision. In our book, The Ethics of Newborn Intensive Care, in 1976, Michael Garland and I wrote that the almost tautological sentence 
quote, parents bear the principal moral responsibility for the well-being of their newborn infant. Almost all other authors strive to state with some specificity about how far this moral responsibility should reach. This emphasis on the centrality of parental responsibility reflected the powerful moral imperative of respect for autonomy that had emerged for a variety of reasons during the 1950s and 1960s. Autonomy in this conception is an expression of the uniqueness of the individual, formed through his or her choices about life and lifestyles. In this formulation, autonomy clearly is not the property of a newborn who knows no options and is incapable of choices and expression. Thus, the moral property of autonomy defaults to the parents who must exercise it in the best interest of their infant. It was not always so clear. Through the long history of Western morals and law, the status of children was tenuously linked to the power of parents to dispose of property. Although always hedged about with some moral restraints, parents could and did give up, expose, or abandon infants. When physicians became involved in birthing, they commonly determined whether the infant they had assisted into the world was able to live or should die. A pioneer neonatologist reflecting on his early years as a clinician wrote, quote, if a two-pound baby of 30 weeks gestation could not survive when drained of mucus and placed in a warm, isolated environment of extra oxygen, no procedure then known to us seemed very likely to increase his chances. If he died as he often did, we presume that he was, in simple terms, unable to live. I began to do case conferences in the intensive care nursery at uh, University of California, San Francisco uh, in the same year that the Johns Hopkins baby film was made. The, uh, the director of neonatology wanted to show that film to the medical students. We did so and we had a, a vigorous discussion about it and it became, uh, as Dr. Bartholomew said, uh, a kind of a landmark in thinking about problems in neonatology. We had weekly case conferences in the nursery. And um, a senior physician, somewhat long retired, Dr. Edward Shaw, would occasionally visit those conferences. Although he mostly listened in silence to the complexities of current neonatology, he would occasionally comment sagely on the case. And he would say from time to time, when a baby's life was in the balance, the baby will tell us. That's the topic of the title of my lecture today. Several months ago, I read a painful art article in the New Yorker, which some of you may have seen, entitled The Aquarium. This opaque title opened into a wrenching story about Isabel, who at nine months of age was discovered to have a brain tumor, an atypical tetroid rhabdoid tumor lodged between her cerebellum and her hypothalamus. Her father, the author of the article, describes the agonizing days that followed, filled with surgical intrusions into Isabel's brain, 
complications, shunting, chemotherapy, scans, repeat surgery, brief intervals of apparent recovery, and lapses. As he tells this tragedy, he also describes the expanding imaginary imagination and vocabulary of Ella, Isabel's three-year-old sister, who, in the midst of the medical crisis, created sweet imaginary worlds. When Isabel dies, Ella told her parents that she just wanted another Isabel. The story ends in the pediatric intensive care unit. Permit me to quote at length the agonized words of the grieving father. The inevitable middle of the night call comes from an intensivist who reports that Isabel is having a really hard time maintaining her blood pressure. When the parents arrive, they find a crowd of ICU staff looking into Isabel's room where she was surrounded by a pack of doctors and nurses. She was bloated, her eyes swollen, her little hands were stabbed with needles as liquid was pumped into her. Dr. Fangaro and Dr. Lulla sat us down to tell us that Isabel's state was dire. Terry and I needed to tell them whether we wanted them to try everything that could save her. We said yes. They made it clear that we would have to be the ones to tell them to stop trying. By Isabel's bed, a gray-haired attending physician, whose name has vanished from my mind, though his face stares at me daily, issues orders as residents take turns compressing Isabel's heartbeat. They bring her back as I wail, my baby, my baby. Then there's another decision that Terry and I have to make. Isabel's kidneys have stopped functioning. She needed dialysis, and an immediate surgical intervention is needed to connect her to the dialysis machine. We say yes to it. Her heart stops again. The gray-haired doctor says, 12 minutes, telling us that she was clinically dead for 12 minutes. Her heart stops again. A young resident is uh, half-heartedly compressing her chest, waiting for us to tell her to stop. We tell her to stop. She stops. That passage reports not only the dreadful death of a baby, it also reflects the stern imperative of parental autonomy. The doctors make it clear that we would have to tell them when to stop, to stop resuscitation, to refrain from dialysis. Those parents must stand by their dying baby, watching life-saving maneuvers mangle her, and then from the depth of their pain and sorrow, issue the order to cease and desist. When I read that passage, I recalled the words of Dr. Shaw, my senior friend in the nursery at UCSF. The baby will tell us. Isabel does not have the autonomy that speaks out its preferences. She has, however, the deeper autonomy that does not choose and speak, but which marks her as a unique, irreplaceable specimen of humanity. Her sister, little Ella, will never have another Isabel. That deeper autonomy manifests its individuality by its physical reality growing, connecting itself together organ by organ, sense to sense, rapidly opening itself to a world of people and things, love, care, and crisis. The newborn infant speaks with its first breath 
announces itself with its first cry. It is this physical message that Dr. Shaw was advising us to listen to. When senior neonatologist Clement Smith wrote, and I quoted before, when the baby died, as he often did, we presumed in simple terms he was unable to live. Often enough in Dr. Shaw and Dr. Smith's time, being unable to live meant being drawn into an environment of air with lungs as yet unable to process oxygen and with no technical means to remedy that inability. The baby was sending a message in its own way with the means available to it. As technical proficiency grows, the baby's message is muffled. We may think of Dr. Shaw and Dr. Smith as old men mumbling metaphors. Even more when we have elevated autonomous decision makers with their yes and no answers to the questions posed by doctors, we are no longer allowed to listen to the baby's message. It is in a medium that is not recognized by ethics or law. It cannot be heard because it expresses itself through experience of the gradual, unf uh, the gradual unfolding of evidence that something that should be growing together is not and will not. It is a message like appreciation of art or music or natural beauty. These speak an inexpressible, though real, language. I am unable to translate the insights of Dr. Shaw and Smith into the logical, practical terms of clinical bioethics. I have no bioethical theory to support them. Yet now, after many years of experience, when I am as old as Dr. Smith and Shaw were when I heard them speak, I believe that behind the logic and theory of bioethics there must be an appreciation of their wisdom. Modern pediatricians and neonatologists have so much skill and knowledge behind, knowledge, and behind that skill and knowledge, there must be a wisdom that teaches them what the baby is saying and that they can convey to the parents of babies whose inarticulate autonomy is telling them it is time to stop. The parents in their grief will often naturally hear their baby unless distracted by the noise of technology and the solemn but often misguided pronouncements of physicians. The wisdom of pediatrics draws both hope and realism from the inarticulate autonomy of its infant patients. Thank you. I appreciate the challenge of figuring out how we know what the baby will tell us. But I was struck by the way, the, the example you gave in the beginning and the example that you gave at the end were two very different types of examples. The last example of the enthusiasm for technology in spite of diminishing returns that might be clear to everybody in the room or close to everybody seems very different from the Hopkins case from 1971. But yet, the, those parents or those physicians might also say the baby should tell us, is telling us, we shouldn't, this has this duodenal atresia, we should not do anything further. So how do we distinguish between those two cases and how do we know when the idea the baby will tell us is being used as an opportunity to say we don't like people who are Mongols? Thank you, Ben. I, I could claim to be inarticulate 
in response to your question, since I've been talking about being inarticulate. But uh, you ask a very good question. There were two very different cases. The first case, the one in the film, and the case in the New Yorker article. Um, it's precisely the work of the field of bioethics to learn how to make those distinctions and to expose them uh, a, a, in their teaching and in their consultation. Every case is a distinct uh, and unique case, uh, although they cluster into classes of cases. Um, the, the kind of case uh, where the idea of the baby speaking its message um, is, is more appropriately applied is a case in which there have been uh, fairly significant efforts to repair the defects uh, that one is dealing with. In the case, of course, of a premature newborn, of a very premature newborn, it's, it's getting lungs to breathe. And um, the, in the case of, the, of baby Isabel, it's a question of making initial surgical attempts in what was considered by the surgeons an operable tumor, although very difficult to get at. However, the repeat operations began to show that the baby was sending its message. So I'm thinking that the difference between those two kinds of cases has to do with the efforts of others to come to grips with the baby's problems, and those, those continue to fail. I remember um, being very impressed when I first uh, consulted uh, in the nursery, hearing fairly commonly, frequently from nurses in the, nurse, in, the, in the nursery, frequently the phrase, what are we doing here? And these would be babies where there had been time after time, efforts to get them to start growing together. And they weren't doing it. <laughs> and there comes a time where by, almost by instinct, you begin to hear the message. It's not going to work. So I, uh, that's the way I would begin to sort those kinds of cases through. Thank you for that. Al, I'm going to unfortunately continue that theme. Uh, in the press right now is a, a new study of Medicare data showing that the likelihood of a person in their last year of life of having a surgical procedure uh, in the last year, about 15 to 20 percent of, of adults, decision makers, are in fact having a, having a surgical procedure. That rises to over 30 percent in the last week of life. So this issue of we're all unique, we're all the same, yet we as scientists try to put them in boxes, make uh, distinctions between them. This challenge of how do we balance that individual and a group process that is not unlike that, that cultural decision of a Mongol has these features. Thank you, Tom. That, um, that of... Uh, <coughs> of course, it moves to a large question of health policy uh, that has its multiple complications. Um, I'm always a little skeptical when I read those last year of life numbers because um, the previous the surgical operation that may precede the last year of life, you don't know whether it's going to be the last year of life or not, and you hope it won't be. <laughs> um, <coughs> and... Uh, and many medical, there's an escalation of procedures when there is a critical illness, regardless of what, of what aspect of life you're in. Uh, there is that kind of escalation. But when the figures are put out to, to, uh, in a gross fashion, that's the kind of data you get. And uh, it, it is probably the case uh, that uh, well-advised people might often reject those procedures if they're well advised. Uh, the the, the um, studies done uh, a few years ago by, um, see, retired professors should just keep their mouths shut because they, you know, the most important thing of a professor is to be able to pull every name right up. Um, the, um, 
um, the guy, uh, the health policy guy at Dartmouth, who did studies of uh, surgery for prostate cancer, and uh, made an effort to give very, very complete, full information to all the patients in the study, and the patients who were fully informed very frequently refused the surgery, given the data that they had about survival and the, at, at a certain age and so. So it's possible with the intense efforts, people would say, no, that's really not what I want. Uh, just several days ago, my brother, um, who, uh, who's uh, age 76, had mitral valve surgery. And um, I think he was, he was not well informed. He did well <coughs> in the surgery, but he really didn't know the risks um, very clearly. It was just, this is what you should do. And he did it. However, there are policy approaches that have been made that don't depend on the decisions of individuals. Um, your neighbors in the state of Oregon have attempted to do that about 20 years ago by drawing up a long list of procedures uh, in terms of their efficacy and costs and so forth. It, it ended up uh, the first, in the first iteration of that list that it was filled with, with paradoxes. I think the first iteration said that the most uh, cost-effective medical procedure is uh, correction of an ingrown toenail. Uh, and that was at the top of the list as something that was fundable. And the least effective was uh, treatment of a very small premature baby. That was at the bottom of the list. So those lists are hard to make sense of oftentimes, but it's a policy approach uh, to look at the cost effectiveness that has to be then worked out into their clinic and into its clinical practicality in talking with patients and so forth. But it's a big piece of that clinical discussion when you say, but of course, if you choose that, there's no insurance for it. Um, that was the attempt in Oregon. I don't know how they've dealt with it, and it, it applied only to to uh, Medicaid patients. Uh, I don't know how it's been dealt with. Is that program still operating in Oregon? Does anybody know? Yeah, and so as to, I know of no other effort to do that. In certain countries, the culture is different. We have studies of a variety of countries where people commonly are not offered expensive procedures at certain ages uh, when I lived in England, I, I had a neighbor who um, had a neurological disease uh, who was worked up first at uh, the Oxford Hospital and then sent home and uh, was never again seen in a hospital. And he died within a year. He was very well cared for by the National Health Service that came and, and kept him comfortable and was admitted to small local hospitals when he had breathing difficulties. He was never intubated, um, never in an intensive care unit, and nobody in that family ever seemed to complain about it. It was what was done. Now that again was 30 years ago and um, has probably changed under the pressure that, that can be developed. But there's no question that that is the crucial policy issue. I'm, I was kind of sticking to the personal decision issue, but thanks, Tom. I'll ask another, I'll ask another question if there's nobody else who has any questions for the moment. Um, so your, your last comments got me thinking um, and reflecting further on what you were saying er earlier about um, how we throw out these different cases. And I want to share with you as well as with the group a, a recent consult that we had here that was not a consult about what occurred at this hospital, but it was really um, hearing the, the experience uh, of a family at another hospital. Um, and this was a, a child who was born with trisomy 18. So like Down syndrome, but with more severe developmental delay, um, most of those kids die within the first year of life, but some live longer. The issue was, in this case, is that 
thinking about this idea of, well, we can't do everything for everybody, there was a pretty clear sense uh, from the, c the other clinical community that it was not appropriate to do things like suctioning or provide oxygen, and this family really ought to be encouraged to go home so their child could die. And they did that reluctantly and with a bit of distress and came here about 11 days after because the child was still alive and, and were also seeking care. And so, again, it gets, the, and the reason I'm bringing this example up is because it seems to me as we think through these policy decisions, how we decide when it's, whom it is appropriate to provide care for, I can imagine using that example, there will be some who will be very clear that something like trisomy 18, of course we shouldn't be providing care for because those kids are going to die at some point. On the other hand, there might be some parents who might say, gee, my child has a 10% chance of living more than a year. So how do we reconcile these different views about something like profound disabilities, and how is this similar or different to what happened with the, uh, the Johns Hopkins case? Yes, yes, yes. Um, I think that the kinds of things we, we talk about in, in the field of bioethics um, provide, if we're any good at what we're doing, uh, provide a, um, a picture of options and possibilities, each of which has its positive and negative features. The positive and negative features not only being uh, the effects on the child, but the effects on family, on parents, and on uh, the hospital, its utilization of, of uh, its resources, on costs, all of those being part of the options pro and con. Um, a second thing that we, we do, if we're good, is to be able to bundle those into certain kinds of cases. So to talk about a baby with Down syndrome in 1971 was breaking open a kind of case that had never been fully discussed and appreciated until that took place. There were the beginnings of concern, but in 1971, Down's children were oftentimes rejected by their parents, institutionalized at a very early age. There were very few programs of any sort to attempt to integrate them into communities which have turned out to be in the long run very successful. So we now have a, we've got a fairly clear picture after a number of years and a lot of efforts and a lot of experience of how to think about a Downs child when it comes to medical care. They're very different than they were then. Other kinds of cases which have been around for a long time but are not very frequent cases the kind of, um, like the uh, pharmacological orphans, not very frequent, don't get that kind of discussion. Um, um, cases uh, of relatively rare genetic conditions, trisomy 13, trisomy 18. Uh, a case that actually happened in, in um, a, a few years ago in which a baby was born uh, anencephalic and the mother wanted to keep the baby and take it home. and. Uh, Every time the baby had a respiratory crisis, because it still had enough brain stem to be uh, breathing on its own, she would bring it into the hospital, and the hospital, uh, on, uh, under federal regulations, MTALA regulations, were required to treat it and resuscitate it, and she'd take it back home. The hospital attempted to stop this, took the case to the law. I, I think the law did not support the hospital. Um, the baby d actually died fairly soon thereafter. But these kinds of cases where, uh, where the, um, that are relatively rare are not very fully and richly discussed as classes of cases. And it seems to me what lacks, what's lacking in that kind of case is, is a much more rich discussion of the quality of life of the baby itself who is being managed in that way. So it's not the parental choice. It, that's what I'm criticizing here. It's not the parental choice that should be dominant. It should be our recognition that the child is not putting itself together and is suffering the consequences itself of living in that fashion. Um, 
at least that would be the way I'd pressure the case to go. Morning. Thanks for those comments. And, and your last comment uh, takes, uh, takes me to my question. You know, in my career, I, I've seen an almost complete shift from the discussions of autonomy in the old days where uh, we had uh, patients and families uh, advocating for uh, comfort care and uh, not so much in pediatrics, but just generally comfort care and, and being allowed to die with dignity uh, with uh, practitioners resisting that sort of approach to uh, virtually the exact opposite these days where I, the, the questions that come to me really have to do with uh, uh, practitioners who have made a determination that continued intervention or continued attempts to, to make progress are not warranted and families aren't there yet. Families aren't there with their children. They aren't there with that decision. Your last comments raise the question, uh, uh, how do we decide uh, uh, as a community of caregivers, as a, as a culture, as a nation, what are the benefits <coughs> of our interventions. So your, your Hopkins case, I, I think we have a very strong consensus now that that relatively simple surgical intervention, uh, the benefits of it completely outweighed whatever uh, risks there were and the, the outcome was a highly desirable outcome. The, I, I read that article in the New Yorker, the Isabella case, uh, you know, ultimately the parents formed a conclusion that continued interventions were not producing any benefits for that poor child. We see so many cases that are in between and, yeah. and we struggle to figure out uh, what interests are to be advanced here. Is it beneficial to this child to have another day of life in the care of loving parents or is it not beneficial because of uh, the, the ultimate prospects or the the uh, pain that that child may undergo. How do we make decisions about beneficence in yes, this context? Yes. Well, that's a, a very poignantly put question, Doctor. I, I experienced uh, over the years exactly the same shift. Um, we often had, when we started the work in bioethics in the 70s, it was frequently the case in which parents in which patients and adult patients, families, wanted treatment to stop <coughs> and the doctors wouldn't do it. Um, the, case, the cases that became famous cases, uh, the Karen Ann Quinlan case, um, of which many people remember, other cases like that were just that the, the, the doctors and the hospitals insisted on continuing. Everybody else in the case said, stop it. Over the, the next 20 years, that shifted dramatically in which uh, health care providers became more ready to stop and, f and, and suggested stopping and, f and um, uh, families were not there yet. I think one of the great advantages of the feel field in which I've worked, the field of bioethics, is that it has, as it's developed, has, has recognized those gaps and that one of the common features of a bioethics consultation is to try to draw both sides together by looking at the variety of circumstances. Frequently, parents will be looking at the quality of life of the infant and, and seeing it terrible. And doctors will say, but the child will survive, you know, may survive. And so somehow that kind of understanding appreciation has to be drawn together. And bioethics consultation, in my experience, very often does that in a way that a, sh that a, sh a pure medical consultation does not because it doesn't oftentimes bring in all the features. So um, the only answer to how do we decide is how do we get people to see the same case? Uh, is it possible to see the same case from different points of view? And um, I think it sometimes is, and it does help. Thank you. Uh, Doctor. You have made a number of very important points. And one point you made is what other countries do, how they make decisions. And, of course, we are 
all these other Western countries have universal health care. We do not. And uh, when you start from a baseline of having care available to everyone, it will make some of the decisions easier. Now, I personally know of many cases or some cases in this country. I'll give you one very important case uh, of a man who was married to a woman who was an employee of a hospital in Washington State who had health insurance only for herself, not for her husband. Her husband had an eminently treatable uh, leukemia and could not, the family could not afford the expensive medication for it. So the man ended up dying. I think if we can ever get to a point where we have universal health care, then some of these decisions at least will be easier to make. Doctor, I appreciate that very much. I, uh, I, I'm in agreement with you. Uh, I, I gave you an example of our neighbor in England and it, it stimulated me at the time, as I say, almost 30 years ago, to investigate a lot more about the English healthcare system at the time. Um, I was admitted to the hospital while we were in England for a procedure, for, a, for a, a test, and I had to stay overnight, and we got a bill for um, one pound. Well, I, I asked my doctor why, where that came from. What, how, how come we got a bill for one pound? And he looked at it and he said, oh, he said, your wife had lunch with you while you were in the hospital. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, um, um, the fact of a common baseline does more than just pay for people's health care. What it does is it gives people a human experience of having support from the beginning of their life onward. So you don't live with the perpetual anxiety of whether you're able to pay for your health care, pay your insurance premiums. You don't live that way and you are taken care of so that when there comes a time when a decision may be made that says no more, you say, well, I've had a lot. And we, haven't, we don't have that experience. In, in our healthcare system. And I suppose they don't have it anymore either because these things have all broken up. But it, it is uh, the, the national nationalization of healthcare does more than just pay bills. It gives a cultural sense of, of confidence and, and uh, support. Well, as uh, someone who participated in some of your seminars at St. Thomas More at Yale, I thank you for yet another uh, very provocative and, and thorough discussion. I, what I, just picking up on some of the initial themes, w one issue with the kids with s severe problems like trisomy 13, trisomy 18, uh, who, uh, and I've taken care of such kids who've gotten to be teenagers, is you need to listen to the baby because some kids are not going to die. And you have to have some, even when we think it's a 95% risk, you've got to have a plan in place Yes. in case that baby doesn't. Yeah. And that was the problem in the case, I think, that, that you brought up. Uh, and another, just another thought on the, uh, kind of on the flip side, um, certainly there are babies, well, most babies have an incredible will to live. I think that's why a number of us, and a lot of us are in pediatrics. But sometimes you do see that disappear. And so I really think that your, your, the title of your talk uh, is still a really, really good one. We have a lot of work to do to figure out how to maybe objectify, objectify some more of that, but I really think it's valid. Thanks. Thank you very much, Doctor. Good to, another Yaley, huh? Um, I, just w one comment in response to that um, is that the, uh, uh, the kind of, uh, crises that arise 
in the course of any medical care or any, any sort of, uh, uh, whether pediatric or adult, uh, always does need a backup that's out there. And we have one now that we didn't have before. Um, I think the development of palliative care also over the last 20 years or so as a real specialty and part of that coming from University of Washington, Dr. Bonica back on pain care and so forth many years ago, developing into a real specialty gives a backup that people didn't have before where you don't have to say there's nothing more that we can do. There is more than we can do and and that is a shift to a different form of care that's appropriate to this patient's future. And I think that's a, a, a great and wonderful development. So thank you very much. Thank you for the questions. <laughs>